32. All that we can gather from the Psalms inscription is that it was written by a man named David. This was King David of the Israelites. But there's no explicit context that's mentioned. But I believe that this psalm is tied to Psalm 51. And in Psalm 51, if you turn over there, we do have uh, a context that's very specific. The inscription reads, A Psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet came to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. So David wrote this psalm after Nathan indicted him of his sin. You all remember the story of, of King David. He was, uh, while his, his people were off fighting this war, King David was languishing on the rooftops. He was wandering around on the rooftops of the palace where he sees this beautiful woman and she's bathing. And instead of, of turning away from this woman, he inquires about her. And he commands that this woman, as the king, he commands that this woman be brought to him knowing full well this woman is married. And she's married to none other than one of David's best soldiers, a man named Uriah the Hittite, one of the mighty men of David. As she comes over to the palace, they sleep together. David gets what he wants out of the situation. He takes what he wants from this woman. She goes home. And for the moment, everything seems like it's going to work out until David receives word that now there's a child involved. Now there's very real, tangible consequences to his decision. She's pregnant. And so David cooks up this scheme to bring Uriah home from the battle to, to just have some time off, some rest and relaxation. And his scheme is that, well, perhaps he'll sleep with his wife and then we can pass this child off as being legitimate. It, it, it'll be his child. And again, the problem will go away. But there's one thing that David didn't count on, and that's his mighty man Uriah being more godly and having more integrity than himself. Uriah said, no, king, how can I sit here and eat this food and be with my wife and be in this beautiful home in my town when my brothers are out fighting for God and for country? I'm not going to do that. So David's plan fails and he's scrambling to find a way to cover up this sinful choice that he made. And he's so desperate, he sends this man with orders to go into the heat of battle so that he would die on the battlefield. And Uriah dies. And now everything seems to be okay. Once again, David, he, he's, he's free. He's free from these consequences. He can marry Bathsheba. He can have this baby as his own and, and pass it off as his child now. And everything again seems to be fine until this man Nathan comes to David. And Nathan was God's prophet. And Nathan comes to David after this child is born. So we're talking about at least nine months of time have gone by, okay? Nine months. Pretty long time. Especially long if you're pregnant. Nine months of time. But in 2 Samuel chapter 12, the word that is used is not infant is not baby. The word that is used is child. So it could be longer than nine months. We could be talking about a year, maybe two years, maybe three years, where David thinks everything's going to work out. But God sent his prophet. And the prophet said, No, David. You know what you have done. You are the man. And he pronounces judgment on David's house. And David, in Psalm 51, that's the context, that's the inscription, David writes this psalm pleading for the forgiveness of God, asking for His grace and His mercy. Verse 4, against you and you only have I sinned. Restore to me your spirit. Don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Make things right with my spirit. I can't live like this any longer. I believe Psalm 32 fits in 
with this very context. And Psalm 32 is a prayer about what's going on in David's head when he's saying to himself and he's pretending that everything is okay. And the question is, how did David feel? As we'll see when we read the psalm, this man felt guilty. He felt guilty. And I want to suggest to you that this is a very good thing. Don't listen to the world. The world wants to explain guilt away. Psychologists have avoided the issue. They've sidestepped guilt. They say guilt doesn't exist. Well, it does exist. We've all felt it before. And so how do we deal with this human emotion? That's the theme uh, of this, this short sermon series. Is we've got these emotions. God put them there. There's a right way to deal with them and there's a wrong way to deal with them. In the book of Psalms, gives us the broad range of human emotion, but it teaches us how to deal with this kind of stuff. And so how do we deal with guilt? Guilt, first of all, four points. Guilt is a dreadful burden, but we receive a merciful pardon when we make a faithful confession and we live in grateful submission. Four points today. First of all, guilt is a dreadful burden. There was a period where David seemed like every, everything was going to be fine. I'm going I'm to get away with this. I'm going to live without the consequences of this. You know, finally, Uriah is dead, and I can, I can sort of soothe my conscience and think, well, he's a, he's a soldier. He knew what he was getting into. He could have died anyway, so you know, I was just hurrying the process along. So I, I, I'm going to marry this woman. The child is, is mine anyway, and, and, and the child can grow up, and everything's going to be fine. In other words... He's trying to cover his tracks. All the external problems are covered up, are painted over, and everything seems fine. But you read verses 3 and 4, and it's clear what's going on in this man's head. Everything is not fine. It may look like it on the outside, but here is a man who is dying on the inside. If you want a description of how guilt feels, it's verses 3 and 4 of Psalm 32. When I kept silent about my sin... My body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. Can you feel the weight? My vitality or, or, or the, the, the fluid of life was drained away as the fever heat of summer. There's a couple things about guilt that we learn from this poem. And that's that guilt can't be hidden. It can't be hidden. David is being haunted by this, this shadow, this specter of regret, and it is crushing him. Yes, like any paranoid person, he doesn't want to be found out, so he tries to cover his tracks, and he does a pretty good job. But do you know who would always know about David's sin besides God? David. David couldn't run away. David couldn't forget. He couldn't unremember because that's how guilt works. You can hide your sin from everyone else except God and yourself. It won't go away on its own. Guilt is the gift that keeps giving. It won't go away. It can't be hidden. But I want you to see, did you notice in verse 4, whose hand was pressing on David? He says, your hand was heavy upon me. This is, this is not some sort of human construct, guilt. Guilt is something that God put within us. And he, when we're feeling guilt, God is appealing to our conscience. You know, when you, uh, you, you get hurt, you slam your finger in a car door. It sends a message from the tip of your finger to your brain. It says, ouch, don't do that again. Right? Or you hold your hand over a fire and your body has a way of telling you, this is not okay, stop doing that. That's what guilt is for the soul, you see. It's, it's the pain of the soul. And, and the guilt, the human guilt that we experience from our choices is like a spiritual thermostat. And it ticks on when something is wrong in our life and it gets hotter and hotter when we don't deal with it. 
and it becomes unbearable. But again, this is a good thing. God put it there for a reason. This is God's hand pressing down on us. And what guilt does is it forces us to deal with our sin. It's wearisome. It's draining our life force, our vitality, our strength. Have you ever gone through a period of prolonged, sustained mourning? Those of you who have lost a loved one very dear to you, those of you who have gone through a separation or divorce or death or something, you, you, you might not eat for days. And you might weep all night. Have you ever wept all night? Crying is, 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 is a draining uh, activity. It will even make you physically ill. But again, this is what guilt is supposed to do. It's supposed to bring us to a crossroads. It's that thorn in our conscience that works itself in deeper and deeper and deeper. At first, it's kind of an annoying thing, but if, if we let it fester, we don't deal with it, we're going to be forced to make a decision and deal with it. Turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 7. Paul wrote 2 Corinthians chapter 7 in response to what he had written before. And in verse 8, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 8, Paul says this, it says, for though I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. For I see that the letter caused you sorrow, though only for a while. I now rejoice, not that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. For you were made sorrowful according to the will of God, so that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces repentance without guilt, without regret, he says, leading to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. And you read something like that and you think, well, Paul, that's just not very nice. You mean you wrote a letter, this pointed letter, and you read 1 Corinthians, and it's not a very nice letter. It's, 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 it's difficult to read. What if it was addressed to Danville? Can you imagine one of our elders standing up here and saying, well, the Apostle Paul addressed us today. Oh, boy. We're, we're divisive. We're not treating each other right. We're not taking the Lord's Supper properly. We're immoral. We don't believe in the resurrection of Jesus. All of these, we're not using our spiritual gifts correctly. 1 Corinthians was a sorrowful letter. You could almost imagine when they unfurled that scroll, there would be little dots of Paul's tears mixing with the ink there. He's sorrowful when he's writing it. It's producing sorrow in these people. It's painful to write it. It's painful to read it. Why would he write something that's so painful? Why would he write something to cause this pain to upset them and upset him? Why put anyone through that mental anguish? It's to help them overcome sin. It's to help them see and feel the weight of sin and help them overcome it because it, he knew. Paul knew that it would produce this guilt in the Corinthian Christians. And that guilt would move them to repentance. And that repentance would bring them to salvation. See, guilt is a catalyst to forgiveness. It's a necessary ingredient to salvation. It's important. Don't listen to the psychologists that want to explain it away. God wired us that way. Now, God doesn't want to crush us with guilt. Satan does. That's exactly what Satan wants to do with your guilt. He wants to crush you. He wants to make you feel like you're worthless and there's nothing you can ever do. He wants to make you feel like there's no hope. He wants to break you with your guilt. That's not God's intention. God designed guilt to draw us to Himself, to seek the answer, to seek release from the guilt, to seek the merciful pardon. And that's what David did. Look at verses 1 and 2 of the psalm. How blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered how blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not count iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Do you hear the, the joy in this man's voice, the wonder, the amazement 
in David's voice. Why? Well, you know what he did, right? It's because he'd been forgiven. Because his slate was wiped clean. He could start over. He had a new heart. His spirit was restored. All because he had been forgiven. Now, forgiveness is a buzzword in the church. It's a buzzword among Christian circles. And we throw that word around so loosely. And I'm not so sure when we use it, we understand exactly what's happening here. But do you see, David... You see why, he, you see, you at least hear his excitement. He is amazed. He is amazed at the concept of grace. It is a stunning thing. He is in, in wonder at the concept of forgiveness, and it's because he felt the weight, he felt the burden of sin. And so guilt helped David and helps us understand sin and appreciate how, how horrible it is. It's that internal wrongness within us. It's, that, it's our conscience telling us thing, things are not right. It's this emotion God has given us to convict our hearts of wrongdoing. And David's heart was condemning him. His conscience was, was saying, David, you're guilty. He didn't need Nathan to point it out, by the way. He already knew verses 3 and 4. He just chose to reject it. Nathan just brought it to life and said, God knows about it. David already knew his conscience was guilty. He committed covetousness. He committed false witness. He committed theft. He committed adultery. He committed murder according to the law. You know what David deserved according to God's righteous law? He deserved to be drag drug out of the city and stoned to death. That's what he deserved. That's what the law taught. But the, David, he knew the consequences of sin. It's not that he didn't understand that. Because the law teaches what sin is. And the law teaches the consequence for sin. But David had been acquainted with it because he had experienced it. He was immersed in, in, in this sinful lifestyle. And he, he uses four different words to describe sin. Four different words. He used the word transgression. Transgression. This is, a, this is the idea of a, of a willing rejection of God's rightful authority. It's the idea that God has drawn a line on the ground and you have made the choice to step over the line. That's transgress. He also uses the word sin. In the Old Testament, it was a crime. It, it, was, it was a grievous offense. But in the New Testament, sin means to miss the mark. So where transgression is about God setting a line and you stepping over it, sin is about God setting a standard and you not meeting it. That we failed in our purpose. That's how he sees his sin. He uses the word iniquity. This carries it with it the idea of crookedness, to be bent or perverted, to be distorted. He was acting crookedly. His life was broken and bent and twisted. He uses the word deceit in whose spirit there is no deceit there in verse 2. We know what that is, to, 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 to lie, to cover up, to deliberately cover up the truth. Falsehood, hypocrisy. Doesn't that describe his life? David was living a lie. He was scrambling to cover up the mess that he made from that one fateful day on the rooftops of the palace in Jerusalem. That's why people do crazy things. That's why we've got to take care of our sin at the beginning. Because if we let it get out of control, if we continue to rebel, we're only going to make matters worse. This is why people who are, are, get addicted to pornography, it gets darker and darker and things that, that would have disgusted them years ago. Now they need that. And then someone finds their computer. And then they're found out. And they don't know what to deal with it. They might murder. They will lie. They will cheat. They might even commit suicide. That's why David is doing the kind of things that he's doing in 2 Samuel. He's trying to cover it up. His whole life is a lie. Why? Because he's feeling this guilt and he's not dealing with it in the right way. But finally... Finally, he's forgiven. He receives the mercy of God. And so guilt helps us understand sin, but guilt also helps us appreciate forgiveness. 
helps us appreciate that all the more. When we feel that burden of guilt, then we'll be able to truly appreciate what forgiveness is all about. Forgive the, the, the sort of illustration I'm going to give, but it's, guilt is like a noose around your neck. And until you feel some tension, until your legs start to kick and you begin to panic and you see the end is near and you see the consequences that are going to come as a result, you're not going to know when the cord is cut. David had felt the noose tighten. He had seen the, he had seen the end. He knew what was coming when God pointed out his sin. And so as strongly as he describes his sin, he describes forgiveness with three different words. He uses the word forgiven. This is the idea of, God, you've carried the burden of my sin away. You've taken away that great, that great weight. And so David sees his sin as this burden. And guilt is the emotion within us that feels its weight. And it's too big for us. It's too heavy for us. It'll overcome us. It'll crush us if we don't deal with it. And there's only one person who's strong enough to take the weight of sin, and that's our God. But what does God do with the sin? He takes it off of our shoulders, and it doesn't float away in the ether and become nothing. He, sin has to be punished, has to be dealt with, and so God had to take it from our life, from our shoulders, and He put it in the body of His only Son, and Jesus took all of our sin to the cross, and He was nailed there, and it died there, and it, He was buried with it. He took our sins. He took our burdens away. So David felt that weight being lifted. David felt his sin being covered. That, that's the idea. It was out of sight. It's not part of the equation anymore. So David saw not only his sin as this great weight, but he saw it as this great stain. And he had tried and tried and tried to cover it up and to paint it over and to make it look okay. But, but only God could cover sin in such a way it wouldn't resurface again. Our house, in the laundry room, there's a spot on our ceiling. And it's a stain there. And it doesn't matter how many times you paint over it. It just keeps coming through. It just keeps coming through. That's what we do. When we try to cover up our guilt about something, try and find ways to make ourselves feel better about it. Maybe we do good things for other people thinking that's going to cover the stain. That doesn't cover the stain. It just keeps coming back. And there's only one thing that can, that can really cover the stain, and that's the covering blood, the atoning blood of Jesus. He says that his sin was not counted. It was not imputed. Blessed is the man uh, in whom, uh, to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity or count iniquity. You, you understand, you all have a credit card. You get the concept. Your, char your, 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 your account has not been charged with the debt. So he sees it as a weight. He sees it as a stain. And he sees it as this m massive accumulated pile of debt. And we just don't have the means to pay it off. David didn't have the treasure to pay it off. But by the mercy of God, he paid it with the blood of his son. Isn't it interesting? As I was, as I was studying this, these these passages are brought up in the New Testament. Paul uses the same word, imputed or counted, not counted. In fact, he uses the same verse to point out when we have faith in God's ability to forgive us, when we have faith in God's ability to take away our sin, not only does He take away the sin from our account, He counts us righteous. That is amazing. Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4 in verse 5. Let's read together. Paul says in verse 5, But to the one who does not work, that is, the one who doesn't try to cover up his sin by himself. To the one who doesn't work, he says, but believes in Him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness, just as David. He's the example, our psalm. 
also speaks of the blessing on the man to whom God credits righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds have been forgiven and whose sins have been covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. Isn't that astounding? God doesn't only remove the sin from our account. He, he adds to our account when we believe in His ability to do that. He adds to our account this infinite treasure of righteousness. That's why David is so amazed by the grace of God. And we should be too. We ought to be amazed by His grace. So now the question is practical. How do we build a bridge from the guilt that's in here to the grace that's available in God? Well, we have to make the faithful confession, which is what David did. And the turning point in the psalm is verses 5 and 6, where David says, I acknowledged my sin to you, and my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and look, and you forgave me the guilt of my sin. Therefore, if you're a God who forgives sin, if you're a God when someone confesses their sin to you openly, therefore, let everyone who is godly pray to you in a time when you may be found. I want to suggest a few things from these verses. The wording, especially in, at the beginning of verse 6, suggests that there is a limit. There is a limit to forgiveness and confession. If, in an audience like this, I know that there's somebody dealing with this very issue. You've, you're carrying some guilt with you. It might be that you know what you have to do to be saved. And this guilt is pressing on you. Let me speak to you. Your guilt is not going to last forever. When we feel guilt, that's the hand of God pressing down. That's, that's what God has ingrained in you and what He's doing. When you're feeling that guilt, He is giving you a window of opportunity for forgiveness. That's what God is doing when you, when you feel that. It's an invitation. And if our conscience is, is bothering us, and if we have a guilty conscience, and we refuse to turn to respond to our guilt and give our sins to God, guess what's going to happen? It's only going to get harder and harder and harder to make things right. Read with me in Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 1. Wisdom says, a man who hardens his neck after much reproof will suddenly be broken beyond remedy. I'm telling you, your guilt isn't going to last. And your guilt is a good thing if you use it and you respond to it in the right way. But if you hold out too long, you're going to break. And you won't ever be able to come back. Confession is limited. Confession, first of all, is made directly to God. Did you notice in verse 5, he says, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. That's what he says. Not to a priest, not to an elder, not to a preacher, not to your best friend, not to mom and dad. He says, to the Lord. Not even to the people he sinned against. And David had sinned against a great many. He had sinned against Bathsheba. What about Bathsheba's parents? Bathsheba had parents. What if that was your daughter? The king just took because he could. How would that make you feel? He sinned against her family. He sinned. What about Uriah's parents? This king takes what he wants. And all of a sudden, I'm supposed to be okay with that. How would that make you feel? What about the rest of the people who probably died on the battlefield? I, I, I dare say there was more than just Uriah that spilled his blood in that battle. So why? Why does, why does the, the first person that David runs to to ask for forgiveness and confess his sin, why is it God? I'll tell you why. In Psalm chapter 51 and verse 4, David says, Against you, you only have 
I sinned. Now, did God only sin against, or did David only sin against God? We are, he, he sinned against many people. There were other people being damaged by his choice. D David, as much as David's sin hurt other people, though, David understood that it hurt God the most. And so he's the one who, who, he, who, he, who he pled to, who he acknowledged his sin to. God wasn't the only one hurt by it, but he confessed to God because God was the only one who was able to do anything about it and forgive his sin. You know, I understand in other places the Bible tells us that we're to confess our sins to one another. James 5 and verse 16. It even goes so far, Jesus goes so far as to say, before you even come worship God, if, if your brother has something against you, you, be, you make yourself right with your brother. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 24. But the point that is made in this psalm, and the point we're making today, is that we're never going to find spiritual forgiveness if we don't bring our confession to God. And so what is confession? Well, first of all, confession is an acknowledgement of sin. David was done sweeping this thing under the rug. He had to open it up. He had to uncover it himself. He had to admit the problem. And, and so do we. When we have guilt, we've got to stop deceiving ourselves into thinking everything's going to be fine. Everything's going to be okay. Just give it time. Listen, time is no healer of guilt. If anything, it will, it will just make God's hand press down even harder. God will never cover our sin if we keep it hidden. So we've got to open it up. We've got to tell God, you know, this is what I've done. We've got to call it what it is. And it's an ownership of sin. It's an ownership of sin. We can't explain it away as a result of a dysfunctional family. Well, that's just the way I was brought up. As a result of psychological tendencies. Well, that's just the way I'm made. We've got to stop victimizing ourselves. We've got to stop shifting the blame and deceiving ourselves. No, blessed is the man in whose spirit there is no deceit. David was through playing games when Nathan said, you're the man. Do you remember David's response in 2 Samuel chapter 12 and verse 13? I have sinned against the Lord. David took ownership. He took responsibility. He didn't see himself as a victim. He saw himself as a culprit. And Nathan said to David, listen, David, there's going to be consequences to your sin. Number one, you're going to lose your child. Number two, your house is going to be a mess. Judgment's coming to your house. The rest of your life is going to be difficult because of the choice that you made. But the most important thing, Nathan said, is the Lord has also taken away your sin. You shall not die. And so what is the proper response to being forgiven, to being not counted guilty, it is grateful subjection. If sin is rebellion against God's authority, then the proper response to His mercy should be to, to willingly come under that authority again, to joyfully submit yourself to the authority of God. In Romans chapter 12, a verse that is so powerful in so many ways, Paul had, had talked about the gospel and, and, and explained the gospel as the power of God into salvation. It appeared apart from the law to take away sin. This just masterfully explains what the gospel is about and how we can be forgiven and how righteousness comes to us. He's explaining all these wonderful mercies of God. And then in chapter 12, he says, here's how you need to respond to it. He says in verse 1, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, by the wonderful things God did for you, I am urging you on the basis of His mercy, you need to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. That's the response. That's the proper response. That's the reasonable response to being forgiven and confessing our sins to God. There's a, a principle in Luke chapter 7, Jesus is telling a, a, a man a parable. And he says, in, in verse 47, he says, The man who is forgiven little, he loves little. But the man who is forgiven much, loves much. The point is not that some people are forgiven a little bit, and some people are forgiven a lot. We've all been forgiven a, a great deal. 
We just need to recognize it. And when we recognize it, we're going to love God even more. But guilt is that thing within us to help us measure the weight of our sins and contrast them to the amazing grace and mercy of God. The proper response, three more things and, and I'll let you go. For, forsake your sin. Forsake your sin. I, I know this isn't explicitly mentioned, but this is certainly implied in the psalm. And we make a mockery of God's mercy if we confess our sin but have no intention to forsake it. In the book of Romans, Paul illustrates repentance as dying to sin. As dying to sin. And, and that person that used to, to live that life, he, say, he personifies that as a man of sin. And you've got to bury that person, even crucify that person, and become an instrument of righteousness to God. Peter describes Jesus as taking our sins in His body on the cross. Why did He do that? So that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. We've got to forsake our sin. We've got to express our joy. This is really important. Some of us don't have enough guilt. Some of us have too much. Some of us have way too much guilt. Sometimes the strangest thing happens when we allow God to remove our sin, right? We come to Him in humble repentance. We confess our sins. The blood of Christ cleanses us, uh, us of all unrighteousness. God removes our sin. But the strangest thing sometimes happens. We hold on to our guilt. We continue to, to feel guilty about things that God has forgiven us of. Instead of saying with David in verse 1, how blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered, we say after we've been forgiven, we say how miserable of a person I am. That's not true. That's simply not true. Paul could say in Romans chapter 7, O wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of death? Thanks be to Jesus Christ who did. And there is now, therefore, no condemnation for those in Christ. In other words, those of you who are in Christ, those of you who are Christians and been forgiven of your sin, stop holding on to your guilt because you don't have it anymore. That is a figment of your imagination. Don't feel guilty about things God has forgiven you of. Once we've been forgiven, those, those feelings of guilt are not valid anymore. And that kind of guilt will drag you down. It's harmful. It holds us back at the very least. But at the very worst, it's a faithless denial of the power of God to take away our sins. Amen. The proper response is joyful praise. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, you righteous ones. And shout for joy, verse 11, all you who are upright in heart. And lastly, from this psalm we see we are to forsake our sin, we are to express our joy, and we are to instruct our neighbors. You know, David made a vow. He made a vow. Remember Psalm 51 was written as, as a plea to God for forgiveness. He made a vow. In Psalm 51 and verse 12, he's asking God, restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. But then he makes this vow in verse 13. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will be converted to you. Doesn't that logically follow? If you've been forgiven, if you'd received a treasure, if, if you had, had, had received this, this great recovery or this great release from an illness, you had this cure for cancer, wouldn't you want to go to everyone with that cancer and say, look at this, look what saved me? That's what David is doing here. You would desperately want to share the physician and his cure. When we're forgiven of our sins, God expects us to do that. To share the wealth. Let me ask you a question in closing. Where is that on your radar? Is that on your radar? This week, I'm going to tell somebody about Jesus. This week, I'm going to talk to this person about forgiveness. When I see some, I'm going to have this heart that I'm going to tell people about the mercies of God and what I have in Jesus. That's got to be on your radar. And if it's not, you might need to start over. Might need to start over. Please close your Bibles and open your songbooks to the song that's been selected. And thank you so much for your kind attention. I really appreciate it. And I've been, I've been learning so much in this series, and I hope you have too. But we don't want to end a service without extending an invitation to get rid of your sin and to get rid of your guilt. If there are sins you need to confess and you're a Christian, 
John has a word to say. Confess your sins. Acknowledge your sins. The blood of Christ will cleanse you. He's righteous and just to forgive you. You understand that is at your, uh, that's at your beck and call. You can, you can pray that prayer in your, in your pew right now. But if it's something that you need to tell us, then come forward. But if you're not a Christian, remember we said guilt is God's way of appealing to you to come to Him? Well, you have a way of appealing to God, and that's through baptism. Peter says baptism saves you not as a, a removal of dirt from the flesh. It's not an outward cleansing. It's about cleaning the inside. It's an appeal to God for a clean conscience through the resurrection of Jesus. If you would like to be baptized and get rid of your guilt, get rid of your sin associated with your guilt, now's the time to do it. And don't wait. Remember, don't wait because that guilt won't last forever. Stand and come forward as we sing.